As the Trump transition team works into the night, the next Secretary of State, which is among the most powerful cabinet roles, has not yet been chosen. The top three contenders appear to be Mitt Romney, Rudy Giuliani, and former General David Petraeus. Tonight, as we've noted, President-elect Trump is dining with Romney. Kentucky senator and former presidential candidate and Trump rival Rand Paul has been thinking a lot about who ought to get that job. And he joins us now. Senator, it's great to see you. Thanks for having me. So here are some of the names that have been floated. We just named them. Uh, in addition to uh, Romney, you had uh, former Mayor Giuliani. You also had John Bolton. Um, would you be happy with any of those three? You know, I think it's important that we, or President Trump, President-elect Trump, nominate somebody who agrees with Donald Trump. Right. Donald Trump spent a lot of time traveling the country saying the Iraq war was a mistake, that nation building hasn't worked or made us safer, it's very expensive, and that regime change has led to unintended consequences. That's exactly where I am. That's why I like Donald Trump, right. is that I think he recognizes Iraq war was a mistake and some of the problems. So he should appoint somebody that recognizes that. I think both Giuliani and, and and Bolton, I would call them unrepentant advocates of the Iraq war. They haven't learned any of the lessons of the Middle East, so I don't think they would represent Donald Trump very well because they don't agree with Donald Trump's positions on the Middle East. What about Mitt Romney? I think it's, I don't know as much, but I know he's been fairly hardcore about supporting the Iraq war. And I haven't heard anything from Romney saying, well, he's skeptical or thinking that we should learn some lessons from that. But another reason why I think this position is very important is Donald Trump also says he wants to build our nation here at home, infrastructure. Right. You can't do nation building abroad and at home. We don't have enough money for that. So I think really you need a secretary of state who believes nation building is too expensive overseas. You know, we put a hundred billion dollars into infrastructure in Afghanistan. We don't have the money to do that and build our roads and bridges here at home. So your Secretary of State needs to agree with Donald Trump on nation building in order to have enough money left over for domestic policy Has as well. Has there ever been a Secretary of State in American history, though, who felt that way? I mean, is it one of those jobs where your views conform to the job and you find yourself identifying maybe a lot more with the concerns of other countries than you thought you would? Well, no, I think you want somebody who uh, one, does generally agree with with the world view of the president. So I think Donald Trump's world view has been Iraq war was a mistake, nation building doesn't work, regime change doesn't work. They may not agree completely, so you may not get a perfect clone of Donald Trump, but I think in order for Donald Trump's vision to be part of the State right. Department, he should appoint somebody who actually agrees with but Donald you, Trump. You keep saying he believed that Iraq war was a mistake, and yet we heard from the press for a year and a half that he was every bit <laughs> as implicated in the Iraq war as Hillary Clinton. Yeah, you know, sometimes the press completely gets it wrong. And this is the time where every night at home I'd be throwing things at my TV saying, why don't they get it? They kept going back to some interview you know, on, Howard Howard, Stern. on Howard yeah. Stern from 10, 15 years ago. And it's like, the point isn't exactly when he understood it, it's that he understands it now. Right. Hillary Clinton never understood it. Hillary Clinton continued to be for, she said she changed her mind on the war, but she continued to be for regime change in Libya. She continued to be for regime change in Syria. Hillary Clinton never learned the lesson of the Iraq war is that sometimes you change a regime. For example, when we got rid of Saddam Hussein, Iran became stronger. Iran is more of a menace now than they were when Saddam yes. Hussein was a counterbalance. So that was an example of regime change destabilizing a region and making us less safe. We got rid of Gaddafi, same thing in Libya. Hillary Clinton never understood that. Donald Trump did. That was a big difference, and yet the media quibbled about when he became opposed to the Iraq war, which wasn't so important as did he understand the lesson of the Iraq war. So you're saying that whoever takes this job needs to understand the lesson of the last 15 Absolutely. years of American foreign policy. But I wonder, does the Republican establishment in Washington understand it? So we're going to see who's chosen Secretary of State, but he'll have a massive staff beneath him, most of them Republicans from D.C., the foreign policy establishment. Right. Have they internalized the lessons? Well, the interesting thing is uh, his pick for National Security Advisor, uh, General Flynn, yes. has said that the historical lesson is that the Iraq War was a strategic failure. So there are people, even from the military, there were many people, you know, in Hillary Clinton's book, many of the generals, other than Petraeus, but many of the generals were saying, you know, regime change isn't going to work in Syria. We're taking our eye off of ISIS because we're getting too involved with trying right. to replace Assad. Petraeus sided with Clinton, of course, so I don't think he really gets the lesson either. Either. But if you look at Hillary Clinton's book about it, she was all for regime change. You know, we got to get rid of Assad. So was Petraeus. But many of the other generals in the region at the time were actually opposed to regime change. So if you were to boil down the purpose of America's foreign policy to a refrigerator magnet you would give to Donald Trump to look at every morning as he pulled his orange juice out of the fridge, what would it say? Defend America. 
defend America. Yeah, and so the thing is, is there also is a difference between the Secretary of Defense and the Secretary of State. The Secretary of Defense has to have us prepared. We have to have the strongest, mightiest military that says, don't ever mess with us. But the Secretary of State needs to be a diplomat that tries to look for solutions other than war. Right. So, for example, if I were contrasting John Bolton with anybody else on the planet, I would say almost everybody else on the planet is more likely to advocate for war being the last resort, where I, was wor I would worry that John Bolton would advocate for war being the first resort. So it's John Bolton versus, as you put it, everyone else on the planet. Everyone that else does on the not planet sound like a ringing endorsement. Everyone else on the planet Bolton. comes in ahead of John Bolton. Okay. Yes, uh, Senator Rand Paul, headed off to dinner with John Bolton. Great to see you. Thanks. And welcome back to Hannity. Senator Marco Rubio was very busy on the campaign trail in Florida. He won re-election and is getting ready to serve now his second term. We're happy to have him back on the program. Senator Rubio, congratulations. Welcome back, sir. Thanks, John. Thank you. All right. I guess the biggest question is Republicans for a long time have said, all right, we need the House. We need the House and Senate, and we also need the White House. Now that moment of opportunity exists. You know Trump, Donald Trump's agenda, vetting refugees, building the wall, uh, repealing, replacing Obamacare, 15% corporate tax rate, repatriation, energy independence. Is there, are you in general agreement with everything? Do you have issues with some things? And how do you think this agenda will go in the Senate? Well, you know, foreign policy, we'll see how that develops. He's had, uh, as I said, he's never held public office before, so he said some things on the campaign trail. We'll see how that translates to foreign policy. But on the issues of domestic policy, you went through some of them. Here's how I think it plays out. I think we spend the early part of January and February working through, you know, dozens and dozens of nominations, not just to the cabinet, but to all sorts of posts underneath that, and try to get those in place as quickly as possible. We move then to Obamacare's repeal, which I think you'll see happen in the first two to three months of, of next year, and, and in addition, begin the work of replacing it, because that's important. And then you talk about some other elements. You talk about border security. Building the wall is a phrase that actually is about securing the border and enforcing our immigration laws. And I, I think that's something we need to move on first. I've, always, I've said now for a long time that it is the key that unlocks the door to be able to do anything else on immigration. So my view is that the first three or four months we're going to be busy. I was going over the Senate schedule for next year, and there's very little recess breaks. I mean, it's going to be a lot of work that's been planned into the time frame that we're going to be here. And the reason why is we anticipate being very busy. Those items that we just discussed, not to mention we need a budget, um, all those things are going to take a lot of time. And I'm, I'm excited about finally being in a position to pass laws and repeal laws and have a president that will actually sign it. What if, what if Senate Democrats are obstructionists? They set the precedent using the nuclear option. Is that something Mitch McConnell should consider? Well, I, let me, I mean, where would it come into play? And if you look at the nominations, they changed the rules. And now by 51 votes, we can get anybody confirmed uh, except for the Supreme Court. And so that's why I fully anticipate that by and large, unless it's someone that something troubling comes out, uh, you're going to see the president-elect get his nominees. Why, you could, at, why couldn't uh, you use it for the Supreme Court or, or can you? Well, I mean, that's an interesting question. I, I believe we're going to get the Supreme Court nomination with the current rules. I really do. And I know he's going to... He, put out a list during the campaign of very qualified people. And I believe we'll get that nomination. I really do. And, and I'll leave it at that for now. But, but uh, as far as all the other ones are concerned, I think we're going to get through those. A lot of good people, names are being mentioned. Obviously, it's his prerogative to choose them. They'll go through our process here. And we're going to move very quickly on that in the early part of the year. And you talk about Obamacare repeal. It was passed through reconciliation. That's 51 votes in the House, in the Senate. And so we can, 51 votes in the Senate, we can repeal Obamacare using the exact same process. And that's, yeah. in fact, the Senate's already done that. We just didn't have a president that would sign it. Now, now we do. Where are your concerns on foreign policy? He said he'd get rid of the Iranian deal. He would also said he would identify radical Islamists. And, but he also talked about foreign entanglements. When we went into Iraq, we had brave men and women fight, bleed, and die for cities like Baghdad, yeah. Mosul, Ramadi, Fallujah. And the war got politicized. Over 5,000 yeah. dead Americans. And then we pull out, and that created a vacuum for ISIS. We, I think you can argue we did the same thing in Vietnam. Over 58,000 yeah. people died. It seems to me foreign entanglements with the political process the way it is just don't work out. Isn't that something we should really try with all we have to avoid? Yeah, well, a couple of points. I'm not in favor of entanglements. I am in favor of engagement. And I do think the world is a better place when America is involved in the world in a way that furthers our national security interests. Those are broad pronouncements uh, on the campaign trail. It's a big world. There are a lot of issues on foreign policy that were not discussed during the campaign. 
Uh, I can't, uh, quite standing here now, say here's one area in the world where I think we're going to have a conflict with the president-elect. I'm saying it's possible. It happened under other presidencies in the past. But uh, as I said, you know, the, you've talked about broad pronouncements in general. I agree. We want to defeat radical Islam. We want to call it for what it is. We want to confront it. We want to defeat it. As commander in chief, he's going to have a significant amount of leeway to conduct that and make that happen. There might be some differences of opinion on some issues. I don't have one to point to for you right now, but there, if there is, yeah. then we'll do our role, which is the Senate's independent of the presidency, and it's our job, if a, no matter who the president is, if they do something you don't agree with, uh, to stand up to that. But I'm, I'm not prepared to do that right now, because as I said, nothing is moving on that, and I think he's still trying to formulate the specifics of a lot of these things. Yeah, I saw the people of Miami, and uh, they celebrated the death, as did I, frankly, of one of the world's brutal murdering Absolutely. dictators, Fidel Castro. But then I read the comments of the president, which I thought did not capture the truth of who this man was, and frankly, the Pope, the Prime Minister of Canada. Uh, what was your reaction to that? And Donald Trump's comments I thought were dead on. Yeah, I liked what the president elect put out. And as I said about the time when the president's statements put out, you cannot talk about the legacy of Fidel Castro without discussing uh, the fact that he forced into exile almost 20 percent of his homeland's population, the fact that he brutally executed people summarily, that he jailed people for 20 to 30 years, that he allowed no political dissent on the island and still did not, um, without talking about the human rights abuses, the way he fomented insurrection and revolution all over the world and, and furthered communism and, and sowed instability in virtually every country in the hemisphere. You can't leave any of that out. And I, you know, somebody had a comment that they compared how the press talked about and the New York Times talked about Pinochet when he died versus how it described Fidel Castro as no. some sort of heroic figure. And, um, and so for me, any statement about his death has to mention the countless numbers of victims, both because of exile, because of jailing, and because of being murdered by his regime. And no, there is no way to talk about his legacy without talking about that, because to me, it is the part that stands out the most. Well said, uh, Senator. Congratulations on your reelection. Great you, to have Sean. you back. Another very busy day for the president-elect. Mr. Trump meeting with more potential nominees for his cabinet, including three contenders for secretary of state. Developments on that just ahead. But first, to the two major appointments today. Our sources say the president-elect has chosen Elaine Chao, a former labor secretary head, I'm sorry, from the labor secretary to head the transportation department. But the bigger news is a selection for health and human services secretary. He picked Georgia Congressman Dr. Tom Price, a fierce critic of Obamacare, who, if confirmed, will likely help him dismantle the disastrous health care law. Democrats are already voicing outrage about the selection. Here's some reaction from the White House. That the president-elect has chosen to um, nominate someone to be his Secretary of Health and Human Services, who is an ardent opponent of the Affordable Care Act, uh, and somebody who says he is committed to repealing it that the only kinds of ideas that have been put forward by the Republicans, to the extent that they've put forward any ideas, and there have not been many, but when they have, they actually have been ideas for undermining the law, not strengthening it. Uh, okay. Their promise to change it, I think, is going to be challenging. All right, Casey, why does this come as a surprise to Democrats? They knew the Donald Trump... Uh, nominee, Donald Trump candidate, Donald Trump said if he won, he was going to dismantle and take apart and maybe repeal and replace Obamacare. Dr. Price, an opponent of, of Obamacare yeah. and has even floated his own alternative to Obamacare. Well, it sounds like somebody really prepared, shovel ready to be able to go in there and head the department and get things done. This is one of the things that uh, the president-elect promised that he would do to his supporters uh, as he campaigned across the country, that he was going to do something to repeal and replace Obamacare. Then we saw that he met with President Obama, who is, by all accounts, quite charming, and talked to him. So maybe they're surprised because they thought maybe he would, you know, walk it back, not do it. He agreed about two things that he was going to do, but it's in the Republican plan as well. So we're going to have to see what his specific ideas are and if that comports with, obviously, what President -elect Trump wants to do. What do you do. think? Why, why, why the surprise on, on the left? Well, I think that the surprise is that this is not someone who has any interest in sort of maintaining a health insurance program not only for people who are the poor who are covered in large part by Obamacare but it goes beyond that to things like Medicare and Medicaid 
and programs that benefit our soldiers. Mm -hmm. So it allows people to opt out. His basic idea, Eric, is that you should go away from a basic entitlement and make it income sensitive. A, a, t a tax credit. So it's a tax credit right. or a tax deduction. He said a tax credit, but it, you have to earn enough to qualify for credit. Yeah, you have to earn a enough. A, du a deduction, you have to earn enough. Yes. A tax credit, a tax can, credit, you, you still have to have. Not so have to earn enough. Well, the poor would not be because they wouldn't be able to get. Of course, they to could. generate it. Of course, they could. That's the that's the difference between a tax cut or tax um, um, deduction and a tax and a credit. credit. If you don't pay taxes and you get a tax credit, you actually get government government sub uh, subsidy. I agree that it's going to be difficult. I mean, it's, a, it's an uphill challenge because President Obama baked the law so far into the system that it will be difficult to dismantle it, but it's not impossible. And Dr. Price, one of the things that he's done is um, introduced a bill that was solely, face solely focused on patients, the mm -hmm. Empowering Patients First Act. And I think Thank that you. that approach would be very welcome for people who supported Donald Trump and beyond, because what it is saying is that we know, remember that study out of Oregon that showed that people on Medicaid had worse health outcomes than people who did not, than before they even were on Medicaid. So what it's saying is that you, it's sort of like school choice. It's like you, person, a citizen of the United States, maybe you don't make enough to get a tax deduction, but we could give you a tax credit, and if you want to shop around and you don't want to have to have Medicaid, and in your state you can shop around for, for different places where you could get better care for your family, it's a radical, radically different approach, and I know, Juan, that one that... Um, I agree. When you're shaking your head, it's going to be difficult, yeah, it's but tough. it's not impossible. So I'm very sensitive to you on this point because I think you've told me personally that this has created a tremendous headache for you. Which one? Obama. Obamacare. Oh yeah, personally, right. Okay. right. So I, I always think, well, gee, <laughs> what is it? What's How the difference here? And my <laughs> sense of it is that something, even what Eric says, that, that the tax credit would benefit because it's a subsidy. But you know, you know what? The way I think of it is. What you're saying is to people in many cases that the tax credit wouldn't even be enough to, ke to ke uh, cover your deductible. Can I jump in here? Yeah. yeah. All right, cool. Who are you? I, my name's Greg. Hey. I usually sit here in the corner. Nice um, to see you. This, this, here's the big problem. When you're taking out the trash, people still see you as taking something away. Correct. And that is the problem with a government program yeah. that is horrible. People still th say, but it's already there. How dare you take it away? Well, the problem is it's yeah. health spending is 17% of our GDP. It's a difference in philosophy. You have a guy named Price who believes in real growth as opposed to a government program, with, which is fake growth. When a government pro program gets bigger, it simply gets bigger and costlier. But if you actually put something in private enterprise, like when you're talking about health medical savings accounts, which he's for, mm -hmm. Then, if the program grows, so does the economy. Everybody gets wealthier. People mm -hmm. get more jobs. That doesn't happen with something like Obamacare. It is nothing more than a program that survives on its own self getting bigger. It, the economy itself doesn't get bigger. That's why it's bad. That's why, you're, that's why he hired, um, or he's, he's putting forth price in this uh, Seema Verma, who is dealing with uh, um, Medicare, and, and she's a health industry expert, to understand this transition, to know for a fact that liberals and Democrats are going to say you're an awful person for getting rid of this program. You have two people there that are saying, no, here's the transition. Here's what we're going to do. I'm all for it. Can I clarify for it. something, though, yeah. guys? Because when he said that I've had problems with Obamacare, the problems I've had have, are, are not about having access to care. I, obviously, I'm in a position where I can be able to afford it. Our problem has been that you have a changing system. Like every six months, you find out that the insurer that you have is no longer going to be covered in Manhattan. So you've got to find another one. Then you find out that the doctor that you wanted doesn't take that insurance anymore, etc. So what, what I'm talking about in terms of these uh, tax credits are for people that might want to have a different or better system and not have to be on the government. And, and, yeah. and the program. beauty of it, I'm sorry, Juan, but the beauty of it is it removes the mandate. The mandate is a part of Obamacare <laughs> okay. that, peop, that people that you know this is people so have such a huge problem with. I, why, why, I think some why conservatives. Would that person, no, this, some conservatives this actually allows it. someone with with a low low income to no income to mm -hmm. take a tax credit and go shop and get good health care, <laughs> yeah. not just be and they don't have enough. It. And it's not large enough to cover even the deductible, which was my earlier point. But here's the thing. Let me just give you what I think is, is Tom Price's heart and soul. And it comes back to something Greg was talking about. Tom Price says government should not be involved right, exactly. with health care. Right. And we should get them out, and health care should be up to you, mm -hmm. individual citizen, Miss Dana Perino. Free market. Right? Free yeah. market. But, but, the, but what is the proposal? Patients. 
<laughs> what is his proposal? His proposal is give it as a block grant to the states. And the states then can determine eligibility. And in some cases, he doesn't even, he, he doesn't even consider anything like income. So I read, read today, one guy said, Bill Gates, under Tom Price's plan, would get the maximum benefit. But a kid under 18, he would be limited. And that kid might have greater needs, let's say, than <coughs> the billion. Well, that was a Bill plan Gates. proposed in 2009. This that's, is it, next, that's his proposal. Okay, right. But nevertheless, he's going to have to put together a plan that the president-elect would also agree with. So, yes, he's somebody who didn't just complain uh, about Obamacare. He came forward with his own ideas and solution. That's positive to begin with. And now what you do is you go back in and learn from what we saw about the pitfalls of Obamacare <clears throat> and make some positive changes so that it's comprehensive reform that actually works. Well, let's it's, gonna end up, it's, yeah. it's all going to end up in the middle. We all know this. It's not going to be purely, you know, private, free market solutions with no government involvement. And it's not going to be all government. It's going to be somewhere in the middle. And it's, but the thing, first thing you got to do is you got to fix or get rid of Obamacare. Yeah, well, yeah, well, well, the budget fix? committee, so I, he I, knows numbers. Well, I, 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 this guy I had a lot, of, a, a lot of alternatives. Yeah. He, he focused on lawsuit abuse, on medical savings accounts, slush funds. He had it all there. And, and by the way, this has to go through Congress as well if you're right. going to eliminate Obamacare and bring something else. So it, he has to work with Congress to come up with an alternative that's acceptable. To, to the Senate and Congress. I'm I, mean, a, I agree it, with that. You're taking something that, I agree he, with he, that. he floated seven years ago right. as an alternative to something that was you. a disaster. No, you, it's not perfect, but it's it, certainly better than what you we have. You guys say, oh, you know, he, there's nothing wrong with him. Why is Josh Earnest lamenting him? Why is Chuck Schumer, who's the incoming minority Can we listen? guy? Can yeah, we listen to that. Uh, Chuck Schumer, Chuck incoming Schumer. Senate minority leader Chuck Schumer, is also voicing his disapproval of the price pick for HHS. Listen. I was just so disappointed to see the president-elect nominate Congressman Price to serve as Secretary of Health and Human Services this morning. When it comes to issues like Medicare, the Affordable Care Act, and Planned Parenthood, Congressman Price and the average American couldn't be further apart. There are a whole number of Republicans who uh, are not going to be for privatizing Medicare, and there ought to be bipartisan support against a secretary who's going to privatize Medicare and not fund Planned Parenthood. Mm -hmm. uh, go ahead, Juan. You're mm -hmm. so the things you were hearing. This, okay, so I was going to say, why is he saying that? Why is Nancy Pelosi saying families are going to get left out in the cold? Twenty they million scare people. Seniors. No, no, I think, I, think so. I think seniors will be scared legitimately because, you know what, people like Medicare in this country. Mm -hmm. People like Social Security. This is Greg's point. It exists, and it's hard to say, I'm going to take this away but from you. But that's not what Trump has said. What? Oh, go and ahead. So I think that President-elect Trump has said that he would actually, uh, would not do anything to take money away from the current Social Security um, system, which actually rankles some on the far right, who has been like, uh, well, we can't really afford that. But... I think Dr. Price is not going to go to HHS and then all of a sudden not be connected to Donald Trump's policy. No, but, but, but remember that Paul Ryan, the speaker, has said he would like to privatize Medicare. Parts right? of it, yes. yes. Why are you smiling? <laughs> because, it's a process. because this is what the yeah. Democrats. Oh. I don't, ex I don't think that there is anyone that Donald Trump would put forward for HHS secretary that Schumer and Pelosi would not say that about. Correct. They've been dining out on the health care issue for so long. But I think that they have to keep in mind. After President Obama went forward with a partisan plan on Obamacare, he then lost congressional seats in 2012, 2014, and 2016. There is a pattern here, and they have a chance to fix it. Eighty percent of people polled at the election said they thought that Obamacare needed to be fixed. Yeah. So if Donald Trump's willing to come to the table and you have yeah. someone like Tom Price, why not take a chance and see if, if there's a, ch a way to make it more affordable and bend the cost curve down like because they said? And a guy with care. a budget background. He took over from Paul Ryan as chairman of the budget. So, like, I think this is good. I'm looking forward well, to it. Well, I just think it's Probably. demolition derby, and this guy is a darling of the insurance industry. That's what uh, he is. Oh. What? Oh. How dare you? Oh. Yeah. You know what he's he's a I'm a darling of it. Oh, yeah. He's a darling the of getting government out of the health care <laughs> business, of which he's going to oversee. you got to love that. Yeah, That's yeah. draining the swamp right there. All right, don't forget, <laughs> oh Vice President-elect Mike Pence is on Hannity tonight. I just bumped into him. I spoke to him for a few minutes. What a great guy. This is a must-see interview. You're going to love that one.